from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Predictions about the future of enterprise tech have never been more uncertain. Predictions become even more challenging when you try to make forecasts that are measurable. I mean, generally our belief is that we should be able to look back a year from now and say with some degree of certainty whether the predictions that we're sharing with you today came true, with some quantifiable evidence to back that up. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, my friend Eric Bradley of ETR and I update our enterprise technology predictions for 2024. We're going to cover the macro IT spending environment, the state of Gen AI, AI ROI, cybersecurity, M&A, data quality, governance, skills, momentum, and from momentum from legacy players and 2024 technology priorities. Eric Bradley, welcome. Good to see you again. Always good to see you too, Dave. I enjoy being on the show every time I get the chance. Thank you. All right, so check this out. I have, again, like every year, over a thousand inbounds from companies, from VC firms, from friends, predictions for 2024. I have been through every one of them with a highlighter for those that I feel like are inspiring and where possible, I'll give credit to those. I mean, there were so many good ones. In a way, I feel like a VC getting all these inbounds and, you know, only... only you shouldn't like, tell everybody that you read every one, Dave. You're going to get five times more next year now. I know, but I do. I go through them. I scan them. I've been doing it for weeks now. And uh, I print them all. I'm sorry. I'm killing trees here, but it's really the only way I can manage it. I, I was thinking this year, Eric, of using AI to to try to prioritize and sift, but I just, you know, the 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 the, the input range was just too big. But at any rate, huge, huge uh, in, in, inbound. We have a graphic on this to to help you understand it relative to last year. So I, I, I bucketized them as best I could. Obviously, a big jump in AI. Uh, Cybersecurity is down, but it's still huge. And the cloud and data center. We even got some predictions around liquid cooling, which I'm not going to use, but I love that. Uh, liquid cooling's back. Remember the old mainframe days? It was all liquid cooling. Had a smattering of DevOps again and digital. And digital was actually, you, you know, I, I, sort of down, but still some stuff in there, SaaS and some other tidbits. Um, so, uh, and then to, let's just do a quick rundown with the next slide of this year's predictions, okay? Um, and then then we'll really get into it. We're going to talk about tech spending like we always do. Uh, Gen AI, you know, we got this ROI focus here and you can sort of see here, I'm not going to go through each one because we're going to go deep. Uh, but but Eric, I'm, I'm super excited to to be with you and, and really want to get into it. So let's start with the macro. The first uh, prediction you see on this first slide, uh, Number one, tech spending increases. If you bring that slide up, Alex, tech spending increases. Nope, next one. Uh, tech spending increases four to 5% in 2024. So when you take a look at this data, so what I did here, Eric, is I took all the macro drill downs and the expectations for the full year spending increase, and I plotted them here. So we exited the isolation economy, very enthusiastic, people thought, their tech budgets were going to increase 7.5%. We know what happened. Ukraine, Fed tightening, and all through 2022, we saw those expectations for the year go down. And then we saw that through, even, even after the Fed stopped tightening, we saw it flatten out at 2.9%. We actually ended up at 3.4% in 2023. And you can see the forecast for 2024 is 4.3%, but it's backloaded. Um, so that's you know a little bit, Eric, of a, of, a, of a concern. You got 2.4% and 3.1% in Q1 and Q2 of 2024, respectively. So we got some work to do to get to 4.3, Eric. Yeah, there's a lot of takeaways on that slide. I feel like we could probably do a, a whole post on, on that. But one of the main things I think we have to stay positive about and optimistic is there does seem to be a thaw in the spending of what we went through over the last you know six quarters. Uh, where, where the spending got abysmally low. Uh, Fortune 500 at one point was less than half a percent. It got down to 0 0.3. Um, and one of the things I like here is not just the overall spend rising, but the largest companies are starting to participate and getting closer to the mean. Now, it's still small companies that are leading the way at about 6.5%. 
But Fortune 500, for example, has gone from 1% to 3% rise in budgets uh, just since July. So we're starting to see the world's largest organizations participate as well, which is really optimistic. Yeah, and, and that said, you, you still have SMB significantly ahead of you know, the, the global 2000, almost double the rate. So you know, that's something that we're watching. I think generally, Eric, organizations are just, there's a lot of uncertainty. I, I think people are waiting for earnings. I think people are afraid that earning es earnings estimates are, are maybe a little bit too high. So they're just gonna take it quarter by quarter. Yeah, there's some positive signs, but the trepidation isn't over. No, not even close. Um, you know, there's still people wondering if there's going to be a soft landing, a hard landing, or even if we're just going to continue to grow at all. But as you said in that slide, you know, the Fed still kind of controls the reins here, and uh, it's a wait and see game with them. But one of the things that is positive is in speaking to our IT decision makers in our community, the cloud audit seems to be over. They spent an entire year just answering to their CEO and CFO about where their spend was, and that seems to be easing. Uh, we're also seeing in the macro survey data that new IT projects are on the rise. So there's a lot of optimistic signs. We're seeing uh, increased net score spending in IT consulting and, and services, which is always a leading indicator. So uh, based on the data, I am cautiously optimistic that this spend and this rise will continue throughout the year. Okay, let's bring up the next prediction. Number two, uh, AI is not a rising tide that lifts all ships. Look. There's this narrative out here that AI is going to benefit everybody. Um, we don't think so. We think AI is a two-edged sword. In some cases, you know, it's helpful. Uh, and, and, you know, you see companies obviously like OpenAI and some others that are really taking advantage of it, notably, you know, some of the cloud vendors. But 40% of customers say that their, their AI budgets are coming from elsewhere. So this chart is just selective here. It shows... Uh, 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 net score or spending momentum on the vertical axis and the overlap in those 1700 accounts. So it's it's plotted by the end. So it's a measure of sort of presence in the data set here. Um, and we just selectively plotted some companies and that red line at 40% indicates a highly elevated uh, spending level. And our premise here is that there's going to be haves and there's going to be have nots. There's going to be some me too AI that lags. And so you can see, uh, this is from the January data, it's the spending momentum in 662 ML and AI accounts. So you can see where there's AI affinity, obviously Microsoft with Azure and AWS up and to the right and well above that 40% line, notably Google is below it, uh, it get, despite their AI chops. And again, this is selective. You got ServiceNow, you got, you got Databricks, you got Snowflake, you got CrowdStrike, all either data companies or well-positioned it looks like in AI. And it's really interesting here, Eric, you got you got laptops, Dell laptop and Apple laptops, and, and we're hearing a lot of talk about AI and laptops and, and, and you know, GPUs and more cost-effective uh, NPUs and laptops. Uh, you got some, we, we added uh, uh, an, a SaaS player like Workday. You got UiPath, that two-edged sword. You got some other observability and, and security companies like Zscaler and Cloudflare in there. You got Mongo, a data company, and then you got some of the legacy guys that we're going to talk about, SAP, Dell, VMware, Oracle, Cisco, uh, and, and HPE. Now, you know, these guys are going to be able to take advantage of AI selectively, either because of their market leadership or because they have acquired assets. In the case, for instance, Cisco and Meraki, right? HPE is acquiring Juniper because of, of, of the missed AI. And so you really have, I think, a mixed bag here. It's not just oh yeah, throw your glove in the field and AI is going to save you. We don't believe that narrative. Er Eric, what do you think? Again, so much there to unpack. Uh, the hyperscalers clearly are the ones that are benefiting the most at the moment. And then of course, when you have sophisticated data companies like Snowflakes and Databricks, uh, also very important at this point in the journey in AI. I thought your comment uh, around Cisco Meraki was interesting, Dave, because when I just recently did the, uh, the quarterly report for Cisco, and Meraki by far was the, the the bright spot in that data set, really shining in not only networking, but also in unified endpoint management. So I, I think it's really interesting your, your case. Uh, Gen AI is certainly not lifting all boats. And I think the biggest battleground right now is an RPA. Really kind of curious to watch and monitor that and see what happens. You know, you would think that Gen AI would boost RPA, but it could also just sort of piggyback it and just kind of jump right over it. And Gen AI, and in itself, it's embedded properly, could end up 
just basically taking RPA out of the market and just do it itself. I think that's the battleground I'm most intrigued to watch this year. It was interesting. You and I talked uh, this week, actually, about the OpenAI alignment, and you guys have a data set on that. We're not going to show it because it's a little too sophisticated for you know, a half-hour show like this. But but what you saw with the with the RPA guys and the automation guys is the the three leaders, uh, Power Automate, UiPath, and Automation Anywhere had strong alignment and affinity to OpenAI, and the others not so much. And so there was some seemed to be some spending momentum around that. You know, we'll see. But I mean, I think generally our sentiment is that market leaders are going to be the AI leaders if they embed AI, they embrace AI, they apply it, they don't AI wash. They partner and they execute. Mike Finley, CTO of Answer Rocket, said you sent in the prediction and the quote: "Me too. AI vendors will sink." Okay, let's go to the 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 next prediction, number three. 2024 is a year of AI ROI, but payback is not assured. This is a chart from one of ETR's drill downs. It asks how soon after the initial deployment did your organization achieve, or does your organization hope to achieve ROI on Gen AI? 57% expect ROI inside of a year, 40% inside of six months. Uh, but you, if you look at things like data quality, skill sets, uh, legal and privacy concerns, those remain you know, challenges and headwinds. And look, if payback may not be high enough to fund massive budget growth, we've seen AI you know, stealing from other areas. We've seen some compression. As Eric was just pointing out, it's a two-edged sword in some sectors. And you, you should expect pushback on co-pilot seat pricing. ETR has some data on that as well, which I saw in the, in the data set, Eric, very interesting that some of the customers are saying, you know what, we don't, ex we don't wanna pay all that extra per seat, per, per, per co-pilot. Yeah, it depends on how widely you're gonna roll it out, right? If you're just gonna allow it to be in a couple of departments, no big deal, but if you're gonna use it at enterprise wide, that, that's a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of licenses to add $30 per seat to. Right now, I think in the testing phase, there isn't too much pushback on pricing, but when it goes into full-scale implementation, I think you're right, it's gonna be difficult. We'll see how they handle that there. Um, just in general, we've been doing a lot of work on generative AI. If anybody wants to hop into our, our data and our, our custom surveys, I'd be happy to go through it. But I think it's amazing to watch the evaluation rates. Only 25% of our ITDM community say that their organization isn't evaluating at all. I haven't seen a technology ramp up this fast. Uh, it's really incredible. But as you said, you know, over a quarter of these people aren't sure there's any ROI at all. That's still a high number. That's a little scary. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting is where is the budget coming from to fund this? Right now, it's split. About half of our organizations are saying that they're funding this with new money. The other half saying they're stealing it from somewhere else. And uh, where it's being stolen from is uh, common sources include non-IT departments and productivity applications. So it's interesting to see as this continues, I want to watch the evaluation rates go into actual use cases, and I want to see where the money's coming from. I'll give you another stat on that when we were, I was digging into some of the RPA data, because that is kind of the obvious two-edged sword area. Mm -hmm. And only 7% of the customers said they're stealing from the RPA budget. But two other points there. One is when you look at certain industries like financial services and, and, uh, and manufacturing and industrials, the figure doubled. So that was a bit of a concern. And when you just you just mentioned, it's coming from other budgets like non-IT budgets and line of business budgets and other sort of productivity budgets, many of those could be automation related. So, you know, those categories aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Yeah, agreed. And, and anecdotally, I've had a, we did a, a panel on this and, and one CIO laughed at the pushback on the pricing. And he said, what do I care about $30 per license if it saves me a hundred full-time employees? So it's really a wait and see game. Um, if the promise of Gen AI actually delivers, I think the pricing demand is gonna be pretty strong. Okay, let's uh, take a look at number four. Uh, the next prediction, power, the power law begins to take shape in 2024. Now, let's explain this because it's really nuanced. The power law really describes, it, it, it's, it takes a, an example from the, uh, the music industry where you had a very hard right angle where just a few labels dominated the industry and you know you had this kind of long tail of, 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 of music producers. Uh, and we see something similar with Gen AI, but different. We see the torso, torso the cloud guys you know dominating and we, we, we take liberties by the way with the term power law. We've got here in the dimensions uh, of, of the vertical dimension is size of model. 
the horizontal dimension is model specificity, and we've identified some industries where we think we're going to see specific models and and potentially on-prem models or likely on-prem models emerging. We, we're already seeing some of that. And the idea being the cloud guys and the big uh, uh, AI uh, uh, LLM vendors, they're going to they're going to have very large models, and they're going to initially they're the ones that are dominating. They're getting all the discussions, but you've got this open source, this red line pulling the torso up and to the right. Llama 2 is the obvious one, but you've got some other independents and other third party and, and open source players that are pulling that up to the right. And then the long tail is the specialized uh, 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 AI. So cloud continues to outpace on-prem, no question, but we're seeing that privacy use cases are emerging and open source pulling that torso up. Based on the ETR data, just playing around with some of it, I, I can I can infer that about 30% of the Llama 2 deployments appear to be on-prem. Meta has indicated it could be as high as 50%, and I don't think, Eric, that in ETR, you're surveying you know, three-letter government agencies, so they're probably doing a lot of stuff on-prem. And we're also seeing the emergence, initial emergence of model integration, um, like private model gardens. Think things like Bedrock, but you're up building your own Bedrock so right now, it's sort of a very mixed environment. We, I guess the prediction really is that you're going to start to see signs of this power law emerge in 2024. What are your thoughts here, Eric? Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, model and, and theory that we're kind of rolling out on this one. I, I do still think that um, there's a little bit of a bifurcation of what's happening, and I think it's too early to tell. But very clearly, there's going to be a long tail to this. We're, we, we forget how early we are in this. It was just a year ago. That OpenAI came out, uh, OpenAI, excuse me. I, there's a lot more to come. I think the most important thing that you said there for me is the data that we're seeing right now in cloud is not just public cloud. We're seeing a real resurgence on the hybrid cloud with a strong leaning towards private. And uh, we're, we're hearing this a lot from our CIOs as well. We just recently did a series of eight interviews on 2024 top trends, and private cloud was you know spoken about by six out of eight of those CIOs. And I do think there's a lot of data concern. There's a lot of regulatory concern still around Gen AI and being you know, in control of that data and having that sovereignty in your own private cloud is one way to handle that. Yeah, and you think about companies that have you know, competitive data and they're trying to use uh, a, a foundation models to give access to their internal sales teams on things like knockoffs and, and, and other sort of competitive information, pricing information and they want that to be available, they're very nervous about putting that in the cloud, they're very nervous about bringing in other data sources, they're nervous about the legal requirements, and so it's going to take some Well, time. they should be, too. As well, they should be. As well, they should be. It's way too early for people to, to just be going around and throwing that data around and, and trusting where it's going to end up. Just some quick hits from some of the other predictions that came in, some of the thousand. John Rose uh, uh, from Dell, he's the CTO of Dell, he said that Gen AI dialogue is going to move from theory to practice and is going to focus more on inference. Uh, Quentin Clark from General Catalyst, the VC predicts that specialized AI will take shape and open source models will emerge. That's consistent with the power law. Bert Greifender, who's the CTO of Dynatrace, predicts that hypermodal AI, which combines different AIs with other data sources, will emerge. And, and much of that is going to happen on-prem in our view. It's interesting. We sometimes forget there's more AI than just Gen AI. And Brian Harris is the CTO at SaaS, predicts that Gen AI has to be viewed as a feature of industry solutions, not a solution in and of itself. Again, we agree that these domain-specific AIs are going to see that long tail. Patrick McFadden of Datastax predicts that we're headed more toward a Gen AI monopoly. So that's sort of counter to the long tail. We hope not, but we kind of agree that hyperscalers right now are in the driver's seat. Uh, he predicted actually back in November that regulators are going to come raining down on these big internet companies, and that prediction has already come through, through with Lena Khan this week taking recent actions. Okay, let's get one, to- One quick thing to add, Dave, if I can on that. I think it's really interesting. In the recent Gen AI study that we did, it split 50-50 between people saying that they're going to develop their own AI solutions using open source, whether it's Anthropic or open AI. And the other 50% are still hoping that it'll become embedded in their already trusted vendors. And those vendors, they've got a window, but it's not that large of a window. They need to really start rolling that out 
and start embedding AI into their offerings, if we're going to see that continue. I just thought it was an interesting data point that came from the study I wanted to sneak in. I'm glad you said that. Five years ago, I, I predicted and, and worked with, collaborated with my, my friend, uh, David Michella, who wrote, he's an author, and, and we kind of predicted, pulled out his prediction that AI, you're going you're gonna to buy it, you're not going to build it. And then, of course, Gen AI comes out and it becomes, wow, this stuff is actually pretty easy, e even though there's still some, some barriers and skills issues. But like, for instance, the Cube AI, you go to thecubeai.com, you can see our, our RAG, our Retrieval Augmented Generation model that we built, um, in your, and, and most people haven't done that. You know, we got a development team, but you're going to see RAG out of the box, and you're going to be able to point that at your data sets. And so it's going to become easier uh, and, and you know, to build your own AI. So I don't know how much of, of that embedded versus build your own is simple rag stuff that you're going to do out of the box versus intense AI. You, you know, we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Okay, let's bring up number five, back to basics in cybersecurity. You know, AI gets all the headlines, um, but it's going to be embedded into cyber and it's going to support these areas shown. Um, it, it, we're, we're seeing identity, single sign-on, vulnerability management, endpoint, network security. These are the areas of information security that are the highest priority in, in organizations, and it's a lot of the same stuff, and we think that consolidation trend is going to continue. Uh, we also think that the, 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 the VCs are going to keep funding uh, of cybersecurity you know, startups because it's still broken, um, so that's counter, but but the consolidation trend is going to favor the consolidators, Palo Alto Network, CrowdStrike, uh, Zscaler, even though consolidation uh, of vendors, of redundant vendors, was the number one method of reducing costs last year, and it's way, way down. There's a premise that we're putting forth here that that is not going to hit as hard in cybersecurity because of the, the, crowd, the, the crowded space. Uh, the identity crisis remains in play and is a major challenge, uh, pun intended. And again, AI is going to be embedded and begin to change the SOC analyst experience. We saw this at, at, at CrowdStrike with the announcement of Charlotte, their LLM, which is you know, very, very powerful. Um, Eric, your thoughts on this data? Yeah, it, it's very interesting what we're seeing right now in the security space. That Everyone is, is really progressing. We're seeing all these vendors roll out different feature sets, really pushing the envelope. And at the same time, we're seeing consolidation happen. And there's so many startups. And my CISO friends are much more likely to take a look at a startup than my CIO friends. Uh, they're just always looking for an edge and, a, and an advantage. So they're willing to test out those Series A through C companies where sometimes you don't see it in the rest of technology. I think we're going to just continue to see importance and explosion of new, new technologies, new features in this space. And I think some of the bigger players are going to have to get a little bit more M&A uh, active if they're going to keep up. Uh, we're seeing that a little bit, but I think we're going to see more of it. I think that environment's thawing out. The other thing I want to point out is anecdotally, and I speak to a lot of security experts, their focus this year is not so much on the tool set. You know, we used to talk all the time about, I want best of breed. I want layers of defense. I need this tool. I need that tool. Right now, all they're talking about is employee training, penetration testing, asset management, vulnerability, patching. They really are getting back to the basic hygiene of security, and that's where their focus is going into this year. And it's not just one. It, it's almost everyone I speak to. So I think it's going to be an interesting year, and I like the way you phrase that and back to basics and security. I agree 100%. Yeah, thanks for that. That's, uh, that's some good, good data points and perspective. Just some predictions and trends from the marketplace. Again, the, the inbounds of Dell's annual data protection survey that Rob Emsley and Michael Wilkie shared with me says 65% of organizations are not confident that their organizations, not very confident their organizations could fully recover from a data loss incident. Uh, the Veeam Data Protection Trends Report found that 52% of production data is backed up on tape still. So everybody says tape is dead. No, it's not. And 61% of production data is also backed up in the cloud. Uh, Dave Russell and Jason Buffington presented these stats you know, to me recently. Um, let's see, voice is going to become the new fingerprint, according to our, our own England, the CPO and CTO of Rev. And Nick Schneider of Arctic Wolf predicts that overhyped tools driving the need for security operations, uh, which of course uh, are driving the need for security operations, of course, which Arctic Wolf provides as a managed service. So um, some, some thank you for sending those stats in, everybody. Okay, number six, private market shifts 
M&A and IPOs pick up. Uh, you know, here's a chart. This is all private companies from the 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 Emerging Technology Survey ETS that uh, e e ETR does. I believe it's quarterly. Um, again, uh, spending momentum of the vertical axis. Uh, actually, sorry, net sentiment, which is a, a intent to engage. Have, do you know the company, and you're going to do anything with them? Are you going to evaluate them? Are you going to deploy them? Are you going to deploy them further? So intent to engage on the vertical axis, and then mind share. Do you know about this company on the horizontal axis? And then we've just picked and, and chosen some names here um, that showed up on like the top the top names in in, in each axis. Um, so you can see here, you know, OpenAI off the charts, Docker, Figma, which I guess you know was was supposed to be uh, acquired by uh, Adobe, and they canceled that acquisition. Databricks, uh, OneTrust, BeyondTrust. Uh, you got Netscope in there. We've talked about them. You got Grafana, Sneak, uh, Redis, database company, uh, Wiz, very hot security company, DBT Labs, the overlay on you know to try to pull metrics out of out of data platforms, Cohere. Uh, an, an LLM player, Anthropic, has uh, gained a lot of uh, VC and other investments from the likes of uh, of Amazon in particular, four billion dollar investment. Also Google. You got Hugging Face in there that a lot of people are doing work with. So we also think you're going to see more smaller seed rounds. Great time to start a company, and VCs love it too because they don't have to put as much in all this AI hype, and you can do more with AI. We think cyber and AI are going to continue to get all the attention, just like all of our inbounds. And we think M&As and IPOs accelerate. Potentially Databricks, Sneak, Arctic Wolf, Beyond Trust. Last year, I think there were probably, I want to say, 150 IPOs down from the previous year. We think we're going to see more IPOs and more IPO action this year, but we're not going to get back to 2021 levels where we saw 1,000 IPOs. Eric, your thoughts? I completely agree. On the private equity side, particularly, they had a lot of money heading into this recessionary period where the headlines got bad and they stopped spending, but they still had the cash. Uh, and I think that environment's really warming up where we're seeing a lot on the private equity side. I mean, heck, New Relic got taken private, Ford Rock and Ping are about to be joined and probably rolled back out again. I think you're still going to see a, a ton of happening on the private side. And I think, yes, IPOs are finally going to warm up again. It's just crazy when you think about a company like, you know, Rubrik or, or Databricks uh, still being private. So I definitely think we're going to see some IPOs. And as far as that M&A activity, there's some names on that list that are just ripe for the picking. I mean, Cohere, Hugging Face, uh, particularly on that side, I, I can't believe they're there. And we're constantly seeing Wiz and Sneak. Incredible data for young companies, really strong, growing their pervasion, growing their mind share. The, you need to take a look at these. If you're a large company and you want to secure up your your security portfolio, there's a lot of names out there like an Arctic Wolf, a Wiz, a Sneak. They need to be looked at. And uh, Mark Sasson of Pinpoint Search Group shared that, and I believe this was just uh, a cyber only, 437 funding rounds and M&A transactions with $8.6 billion, billion raised over 346 rounds and 91 total acquisitions last year. So we'll keep an eye on that. Okay. Let's go on to the next one, number seven, data quality and governance concerns favor trusted ecosystems. Let's talk about this. Um, th this chart uh, from ETR asks, which aspects of your organization's data and analytics programs are your, are your organization prioritizing um, the most to support Gen AI goals? Select up to two options, data quality, data lakes, data diversity, data literacy, data integrations, governance, metadata management, and we think these, this favors trusted platforms that have ecosystems to support these, these types of activities. AWS, Azure, obviously Google, the hyperscalers, even though AWS and Azure are well ahead of Google Cloud, but Snowflake and Databricks, even Oracle, and it's a trusted platform, it's got transactions. You know, when you start to think about the sixth data platform that we've talked about moving beyond just separating compute from storage, separating compute from data, uh, actually unifying metadata. You know, this, this it gets complicated because of all these other factors as well when you have different data types like transaction data and unstructured data and distributed data and different query types. Uh, and when you're bringing together transactions and analytics at scale, you got to throw in Oracle in there because they're the, the, the company with the, the transaction data. I would throw in IBM as well. We're going to talk about them a little bit later. Uh, but so... You've got some interesting activity going on here where 
people are really focused on, you know, data quality improving. And, you know, we think, I don't know if you agree, Eric, that this is going to favor some of those established platforms. Without a doubt. And the data, we're going to get to it in a minute. So I don't want to kind of, you know, steal the headline. But, you know, I love that you're bringing up Oracle, IBM, Dell. Their, their data set looks fantastic heading into 2024, something I haven't been able to say in quite some time. But when we talk about this particular aspect, it all comes down to data quality. That's what we're hearing. I don't care who you are, if you want to use a large language model, any sort of AI at all, it comes down to your data quality. And we run a data company, and I know for a fact it's garbage in, garbage out. You have to have good quality data. After that, it's about the ecosystem. It's about your ETLs, your pipes, and then you can finally get into an analysis and getting it into your hands of your business users. But I still think we're at the stage of data quality. Um, I think it's utmost importance, and you could see in our data set, I think it was you know two to one favored. Uh, any other aspect in that answer option in that survey. Okay, great, thank you. Let's bring up number eight, renewed importance of new data literacy and skills uh, and yes code, which I'll explain, but this came in from Eric Bradley. I'll just read it verbatim, Gen AI, as well as more business user-friendly self-service capabilities like low code, no code, RPA, and Gen UI tools, code generated from screen grabs. That's my little addition. Bring <laughs> with it new sets of skills that will be in demand in the market. Watch for the rise in offerings from IT training companies like Pluralsight, Skillsoft, LinkedIn, Learning, uh, Coursera, et cetera, that focus on things like Gen AI, prompt management, or ethical responsible use of Gen AI, et cetera. We'll start to see new roles like, I love this, Gen AI prompt engineering, Eric, you're right on on that. In the market, as more orgs let Gen AI proliferate, there will need to be more data literacy training in general across the workforce so that the outputs from Gen AI are used properly and Gen AI hallucinations are seen with a critical eye or minimized. And yes, code is Gen AI plus front end tools equal generative UI. That's from Lee Robinson, VP of product at Vercel. But Eric, this is, this is your wheelhouse. You shared this prediction with me. Thanks for doing that. Maybe you could elaborate. Yeah, sure. First of all, I got to give all credit to my senior analyst, Dr. Darren Brabham. This was uh, this was him. He's the one who leads uh, all data uh, aspects for us here at ETR, and he's fantastic. So I'm going to give him credit before he sees that and gets mad at me. So uh, this was Darren's, but I completely agree with him. And one of the things I want to add anecdotally, which I find really interesting, is I'm seeing Gen AI prompt as a skill set listed in job descriptions and even in resumes that we're getting. Uh, I've never seen that before. That's something that's just new in the last month or so. But basically what this comes down to is there's a lot of non-technical business users that need to become more data literate and develop those skills just to stay relevant in their own jobs, whether it's me at age 49 or whether it's somebody young. You have to figure this out. And there's a lot of forces that are happening, whether it's low code, no code apps or the rise of Gen AI. It's all converging to make sure that the business users themselves can actually handle this type of workflow. And you have to become data literate. It's not gonna be difficult because the vendors are making it easy, but you do have to make a little bit of an effort to actually stay relevant in the, today's world. And as we're seeing, the majority of the budget for AI right now is coming from the business departments themselves, non-IT related. So I think this is a trend that's here to stay. I would urge any young people out there to go ahead and make sure you get yourself at least a little data literate. Great, thank you for that, uh, Eric and Darren. Okay, let's bring up number nine, legacy rebound, powered by AI, laptops, cloud, and acquired assets. So this is really interesting. So first of all, we're showing you a chart. It's a shared net score on the vertical axis and overlap, which is plotted, it's, it's informed by the N. Uh, so it's really a measure of presence and overlap within that 1700, 1766 N in the accounts. And we plotted, Eric, I just, I, I, I picked, you know, some legacy companies, some, some, and legacy, I guess is a derogatory term. It's a pejorative, but to me, it's not. I mean, you build a legacy. Exactly. Uh, I got a friend who has a you financial earn a legacy. Yeah. He calls it legacy. I mean, he's been in business 30 years. He's, he's a, he's a very successful financial planner. Anyway, um, you got Cisco on here, Oracle, IBM, Dell, HPE, but uh, IBM, IBM Watson, SAP HANA, really, one of the few up over that 40% mark. But what's in Meraki, we talked about before, Red Hat, which is the asset, Aruba, which is an acquired asset. Well, the most interesting thing here is the momentum that we're seeing in the market on laptops. And we know there's a new Windows cycle coming. There's a, a laptop refresh fresh cycle. 
Apple has en had NPUs in its systems for a long, long time. Dell laptops, you know, I, I think are going to power that company, you know, this year. Cisco acquiring uh, 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 Meraki, really doing more with that asset, now acquiring Splunk. IBM getting its act together with Watson. You saw its, its recent earnings announcement. Looks like Arvind Krishna really has that company on the right track. It's got the, the Red Hat acquisition. So you're seeing these, these legacy companies, these established companies, um, in the case of Oracle, investing, they've certainly done a lot of R&D work. They, they made making huge acquisitions like Cerner. Uh, and, and whereas in the old days, Eric, you, you had situations where the, the big established companies would poo-poo the next wave. You know, we saw that with the Dex, the Primes, the Wangs, the DGs, companies that young people in this audience have never even heard of. They were high flyers, Sun Microsystems. They were the hottest companies going. They're gone now because they poo-pooed the future. These leaders today, they don't dismiss the future. They invest in it uh, because they're paranoid. Only the paranoid survive, as Andy Grove said. Uh, but I'll throw it to you. This is something that you put on my radar. What are you seeing in the ETR data and what makes you sanguine about some of these legacy companies? Yeah, I haven't been excited about these companies in a very long time. The data looks incredible across the board, and it's amazing the breadth of the the rebound we're seeing in their spending trajectory. It's not just one area. It's coming from cloud. It's coming from the data side. Um, in the instance of IBM, man, Red Hat, and Ansible, they're just doing fantastic. You know, VMware, what's happened there with Broadcom going away from their channel partner was just stupid. I don't know what else to say. And what we're seeing right now is so much share shifting away from that to some of these other people. And they're trusted. They're already entrenched in an organization. And what happened, at least what I'm hearing anecdotally, is a couple of years ago, people were saying, I'm sorry, Oracle, IBM, Dell, you know, SAP, you guys are great, but you didn't keep up. And I'm really going to shift over to the cloud. I'm going to take a look at this. And then what happened? The world kind of paused. Spending paused. And they didn't do it. Now, two years later, I'm talking to them and they're saying, you know what? These things kind of got a little bit better. <laughs> they caught up. I actually think it's a pretty good product now. And is it really a priority for me to spend all this time and capital and resources to shift off what's an improving product to go to the cloud? And at the same time, they just went through a cloud audit and found out the cloud's not always as cheap as you think it is. So what we're seeing right now is that these, these companies were all given a second life, without a doubt. And we're seeing the data broadly improve for them in many areas. And it's going to be great to see what they do with it. They've gotten a second chance. And, and I hope that they just continue investing using R&D wisely and, you know, going after some M&A and just keeping their footing because, you know, no one wants to see a world where it's just Microsoft and AWS and the enterprise. Yeah, so I'll share as well just some, uh, uh, some pros from a recent uh, uh, report you guys just put out. Don't call it comeback. They've been here for years. ETR's data rebound on legacy companies like IBM, Oracle, and Dell. Working thesis, the recessionary environment and budget crunch stopped the planned lift and shift of core mission critical apps to cloud providers, giving these companies time to catch up. Now coming out the other side, the existing functionality is good enough and replacing them no longer is the top priority. You know, let's see what they do with this. Second chance, as you just mentioned, and the legacy names that we just talked about asserting their presence back in the cloud race, like Oracle with OCI, uh, you know, IBM sort of in a different way, really focusing on the hybrid cloud, which seems to be working. Dell as well has got, you know, its, its, its cloud in the form of Apex, HPE uh, with, with its GreenLake. Asserting their presence back in the cloud race can be something to watch this year. Uh, and with, with that comes other renewals of legacy software footprints, hardware refreshes, software servers, storage, et cetera. And then as we saw in that chart, Laptops, and we're going to see a, a laptop refresh cycle. Uh, we think we we heard it in Intel's. Intel had you know very disappointing earnings, but they did point to uh, growth in future quarters, really due to uh, to PC sales. Okay. Yeah. The, the data, real quickly, the data on that is is very strong. I I easily we could have put a a full hardware refresh cycle into this prediction post. Um, I think maybe just it might be a little bit well known, so we chose not to, but. The data across the board in all areas of, of hardware, not just the laptops and PCs, but we're also seeing in storage and servers, um, there's definitely a refresh cycle coming in the hardware space. And that's good news for these companies. And, and, and look, there's so much territory that we could cover on these. What we try to do, and, and thank you again, everybody who's sending in these 
literally thousands and thousands and thousands of inbounds. We really appreciate it. We try to find predictions that A, can be quantified, so we, they're kind of binary, Did we, were we right or wrong? And B, does it align with some data that we have? We can actually actually go back and, and do that look back, but so thank you again. Okay, the last one, let's bring up number 10, tech priority, cyber, analytics, AI, collaboration, cloud, networking, and automation remain the top tech priorities. Um, look, you know, this chart, we, you guys run this, this is an N of 890. Cyber has always been the top priority. Yeah, it's, it's maybe down a little bit, but no matter what industry you look at, no matter what geography you look at, it's right up there. Analytics, holding strong, data warehousing, data matters. You know, and, and even given all the Gen AI hype, uh, which you can see is on a nice steep uptick here, it's still people got to get their data act together before they can really take advantage of that. Collaboration was obviously top dog or a top dog during the pandemic, you know, still important. You know, cl cloud, yeah, it's tapered off a little bit. Uh, cloud optimization was a big thing last year, but cloud is still where a lot of the innovation is happening. The optionality in cloud, the ecosystems in cloud are still really powering innovation. Networking becomes more important in the world of, of AI. It's like the new bottleneck. And you know, we, we've, we've talked about RPA. It's, it's been a hot market for a long, long time. So it makes the cut here. Um, and as you can see, it's picking up a little bit. It's the classic two-edged sword, Eric, with, with RPA. Your thoughts yeah, on this? I think, the, I think the most interesting aspect in that, and, and we do run this all the time, and it doesn't change that often. So even a small integer movement is actually of interest. And, and that cloud migration number, that's a big drop. Uh, to me, that's the main takeaway. When I, when I first ran this study and we looked at it, I always expect security to be the number one. I was not shocked by the movement in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Cloud migration was. So after we ran the survey, I did eight interviews, uh, top trend series, which I'll be releasing down on Tuesday. It's an amalgamation of all the findings. And we asked people about this. Why is cloud migration show it's slowing? And they said basically that everyone always anticipated their cloud workloads to get to 60, 70, 80%, but it's happening much, much slower than they ever anticipated. It's still happening. It's just not happening as fast. And the majority of the people I interviewed, again, were talking more about building out private cloud assets. They wanted more of a hybrid model, not directly going to cloud migration to public cloud. Yeah, this is interesting because I, I think that is a somewhat of a concern. I, I've been forecasting, we saw last quarter, Amazon's growth rate, the deceleration of that growth rate stabilized. And I'm expecting an uptick this quarter, cool. not a huge, but an uptick, maybe a couple points in growth, really from Gen AI. Uh, I would expect the same for Azure, and we saw a little Azure action or Gen AI action last quarter from uh, from Microsoft. Microsoft announced, I think, on the 30th, and AWS or Amazon shortly thereafter. I think you're right. I think well, a couple of things is I think the prevailing uh, narrative that 90% of the work remains on prem. A big chunk of that is telco. And that telco and that whole telco market, that communications market, is probably as big as the traditional IT market. So if you take that out, a much higher percentage of the workloads are actually already in the cloud. So it's not so much a story of migration anymore. It's a battle for new work, new workloads, new spending. Much of that AI work is being done in the cloud today, but because of the reasons that we mentioned before and the whole a discussion that we had talked about around the long tail of the Gen AI power law, and the fact that budgets just aren't going through the roof like they were in 2020 and 2021, people have to make choices and they have to make trade-offs. I'll give you the last word on that, Eric. Yeah, very interesting on that, I agree. I also, I just wanted to point out your comment about AWS, anyone that actually follows our data, you wouldn't have been surprised in the slowdown on AWS in the cloud. You really wouldn't. I, I'm looking at my chart right now, just going straight down to the right. You know, went from 70% down to 40% uh, over the course of, Jan of 2022 and 2023. Uh, what we are seeing now, however, was a really significant rebound. So uh, that cloud audit does seem to be over anecdotally when I speak to people. Uh, and I do think your comment was spot on. It's not anymore about the migration of, it's just actually, you know, what work is being done there. And it's going to have a very long tail. We, the digital transformation is not over. It's a long tail game. And I still think cloud is healthy, but uh, you can't really keep those growth rates up forever. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely the new wave. It's not about cloud migration anymore. That lift and shift occurred. We, we squeezed a lot of juice from that lemon. There's maybe some left, but now it's all about innovation. And I think a lot of that is coming from Gen AI. We've noticed, I've noticed just anecdotally looking at the data um, from the, the drill downs and the ETR data that when a company announces a, a Gen AI and it, and it goes of, of GA, you get a big uplift. We saw this with Vertex um, in, at, 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 at Google Cloud Next. We certainly saw this at Microsoft. I would expect we're going to see this with, uh, with Bedrock going GA. I think it went GA late last summer, maybe September, maybe even October timeframe. So I would expect to see that in the Q4 numbers. Yeah, but hey, as always, Eric, appreciate your time. And we're going to be here tracking this on an ongoing basis. You guys do tremendous work. Really appreciate the collaboration. I think this is our, this is our third predictions, right? Third year. So third year in a row, yeah. I always enjoy it. So thanks again. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Myerson and Ken Schiffman on production. And Alex also manages the podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Thank you all. Remember, these episodes are all available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on the Cube Research dot com, formerly Wikibon, and SiliconAngle.com, and you can email me at david.belante at SiliconAngle.com or DM me at dbelante. Comment on our LinkedIn posts and definitely check out etr.ai. Not only do they have the best survey data in the business, we're going to market together. You know, we're working very closely with the Cube Research Analysts and the ETR data, so check that out. This is Dave Belante for the Cube Research Ins Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.